10 to begin our program. So we'll, we're encouraging folks to go ahead and continue to add that into the comment section. I want to just say for, for the record that the, that the Judicial Accountability Team, the JAT, as, as some of us call it, call it affectionately, is a C3 coalition and it does not do endorsements, all right? Uh, so today's forum is for public education purposes. And I believe deeply that one of the greatest things that we can be doing uh, in this particular moment is offering political, ed political education to the masses. And we're so grateful for Reclaim Philadelphia for the great work that they're doing, helping to put on things like that, as well as this wonderful group here and all of those who are doing the work in this moment to create accessibility to the political information that our people need to get free. And if I was in the church house, I'd say, can I get an amen? So again, this is super, super important for us to make sure that, uh, that we're sharing this information out. But we do want you to know this is a C3 coalition. There will be no formal endorsements coming out of this group, but this information is invaluable just the same. I want to set a few, couple of, uh, set a few guidelines before we get started. Uh, uh, these are four that we think are important for folks to know. If you are not speaking, if you are not speaking in the course of this discussion, Please be sure to keep yourself on mute. Amen. If you are not speaking, please do us a favor and keep yourself on mute so that we can hear the speakers. Um, uh, our, our, as the, as the, as I love this phrase, our zoomologists will also kindly mute folks. Amen. So if you are having some struggles, I know, uh, you know, sometimes we get a little flustered. Uh, if we hear you and you're not able to get there quick enough because we want to keep things going fluidly, please, uh, you know, don't, don't be too upset with us. We're going to go ahead and mute, mute you ourselves so we can go forward. All right. So that's our first request. Our second one is there are a lot of people here today with differing opinions, right? Lots of different ideas, lots of different value sets, lots of different viewpoints. Uh, so be sure to keep the language in the chat respectful. We want, to, we want to be mindful that, that we are a, a, a group of, of organizations uh, that are community-based. We are not here to, to, to fight for fight's sake. We're here to get our people free. We're here to have and create community that's just and, and liberative. And so we want to make sure that our conversation, our discourse is reflective of that. So let's be, let's be respectful to folks in the, in the chat section, even if we have different values, different opinions. We want to be mindful of our language in the chat. Thank you so much. Thirdly, today's forum is being recorded, as I've already stated. And so if you do not want to be recorded, we're going to say again here for you, kindly turn off your camera so that way we can avoid any kind of uh, misunderstanding in that way. And fourthly, the judicial candidates are encouraged to share their campaign website. So for all of you judicial candidates out there, we're encouraging you to share your campaign website and social media platforms in the chat. So please refrain from spamming the chat. Uh, we want to make sure that folks have access to the website and to their social media platforms so these candidates are accessible, right? These are folks who are running for public office and the people need to have a chance to, 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 to know them and connect to them. And so we're hopefully, hopefully they can do that through social media uh, or through their campaign website. And we want to make sure that it's easy to find in the chat section. So please refrain, refrain from spamming the chat, uh, doing any soliciting in there. We want to keep it, keep it pretty clear. All right. All right. All right, I just, just as a re refresher again, number one, if you're not speaking, please be sure to keep yourself on mute um, so that we can hear our speakers. If you're unable to mute yourself, we will do so quickly. Our Zoomologist will handle that for us. Two, there are a lot of folks uh, with different opinions. And so we're asking you to keep the language in the chat respectful. Thirdly, the form is being recorded. And so if you don't wanna be recorded yourself, kindly turn your camera off and uh, please do not spam the chat. The judicial candidates are being encouraged to share their campaign website and social media platforms in the chat there, okay? All right. That having been said, again, this forum tonight is another step in the direction towards a decarcerated Philadelphia decarcerated commonwealth. The idea here is that in the last several years, we have seen a number of organizations take very seriously the need for us to get uh, uh, more intentional about who we are electing to offices that are incarcerating our people, right? We saw in 2017, 2017, a number of folks uh, uh, go out into the community and help educate folks around the importance of having a just district attorney. We saw in 2017, ultimately, the election of one uh, that many believed was, in fact, that. 
But we know that not only are our prosecutors and our DAs, right, the gatekeepers to our jails and the folks who are, are driving incarceration in our areas, we also know that judges, as well, alongside police officers as well, are also folks uh, who have an impact on this. And so making sure that our judges are just is of a major concern to those of us who are connected to this and are putting this forward. And so we're, we're excited about the folks who are, are gay, engaging in this conversation. We're thinking rigorously about how we might make sure that our, our those who are on the bench are actually delivering justice, right, uh, and not uh, bought off and and not uh, furthering ideas and ways of being and 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 and, and operating uh, that are not directly decarceral. So this is towards that. This is another step in the direction towards creating a just Philadelphia by making sure not only the, the DA's office but also our our courtrooms are. Are, are occupied by persons with justice in mind, true justice in mind. With that having been said, we're so grateful for those that are watching. We're looking forward to this discussion. I'm excited to be with you for the fullness of this uh, hour or so or two hours that we're together. Let me turn it over to Katia Perez as she offers up the instructions to our candidates. Katia. Thank you, Nicholas. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Judge the Judges uh, Judicial Candidate Forum. Uh, my name is Katia Perez. I'm the Mass Liberation Organizer at Reclaim Philadelphia, and I also coordinate the Judge Accountability Table. And I'm going to um, read some instructions for the judicial candidates here today, tonight. Um, so in the interest of fairness and honesty, do you pledge to the voters of Philadelphia that you will participate in this forum in good faith? Now, all the candidates have yes or no signs that you all printed out at home. So if you can hold up your answer on the screen and I will repeat the question. In the interest of fairness and honesty, do you pledge to the voters of Philadelphia that you will participate in this forum in good faith? If everyone can please hold up their sign. And I will change the view <laughs> so we can all actually see that. All right. Um, in an email sent to you yesterday, you were instructed to refrain from sharing details of the, uh, of the questions asked in today's forum until after tomorrow's segment has been completed. Do you pledge to follow this instruction? If you can please hold up your answer again. And I'm repeating the question one more time. Um, in an email sent to you yesterday, you were instructed to refrain from sharing details of the questions asked in today's forum until after tomorrow's segment has been completed. Again, do you pledge to follow this instruction? Just one more time, please. All right, thank you folks. Uh, Nick, I am sending it back to you. All right, thank you Katia for that clarification. We are gonna move swiftly into our first section of questions. All right, this is our yes and no round. Uh, uh, we are looking for explicit answers. We're looking for yes and no, and our candidates, as you have all seen, already have their cards with them. Uh, a straight yes or a no is what we're looking for for the four questions that are coming at this point. I want to say, just for clarity's sake, uh, that that a, can't, that a person is going to come forward representing a, a different group each time and pose a question to you, candidates. Uh, at the point that that question is being posed, our ask is that you hold your answer card up, your yes or no, to the, to the question in front of the camera until you've called, until we have called your name and we've recorded uh, your answer aloud, all right? So we want you to stay holding it up until your name has been called and we have recorded your answer aloud. Um, if it just so happens that all of you have the same answer, we'll, we'll notify that at that point and then, and then at, upon me saying so, you can put your card down, all right? So we wanna make sure that we're not missing anything, we're not seeing any answers, switch anything like that. We wanna make sure you put your card up and hold it there until we've called your name. And then once we have finished that, uh, uh, you can you can go ahead and put it down. And for the sake of making sure that folks are aware of who is with us tonight, uh, before we begin our before we call up our first questioner, I just want to remind folks that the candidates for tonight that are answering questions uh, are one Betsy Wall, Chris Hall, Craig Levine, Greg Yorgi Gerdy, John Padova, Michael Lambert. Michelle Hangley, Nick Kamau, Sherry Joyce Cohen, 
and Wendy Barish. All right, all right, all right. And so we all are so thankful that you all have joined us tonight um, and engaged with this conversation. That having been said, let's not belabor, let's move right into it. I wanna call up Assad Hafez from the Working Families Organization. Brother Assad, you got a question for our folks? <clears throat> yes, hi. Um, I first and foremost wanna thank everybody for being on here. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to, you know, be engaged and to really be a part of the process of, you know, becoming better, not only as an individual, but as a community and, and really as a country. Um, and I think that this is a perfect opportunity, you know, to, you know, to do things just like that, you know, to kind of get to know one another and more importantly, to really overall be able to, you know, be the best that we can be in terms of always presenting what it is that bothers us, what it is that we want to talk about and things that um, mean a lot to everybody. And so um, I want to um, first and foremost, um, basically say that um, um, I personally had an experience recently um, in which I was driving and then, um, you know, I was um, at a red light and then um, in Philadelphia, I don't know if you're familiar, but sometimes there's three lanes and um, there's one lane that's usually, you know, that has, you know, cars parked in it. And so um, I don't know if you've ever seen where there might be cars parked in the middle of uh, Broad Street, but then there's sometimes there's three lanes. And um, I ended up in the third lane and then I immediately tried to get over to the, uh, to the um, left lane. And um, I did it, you know, um, you know, pretty swiftly and end up um, getting in front of somebody and didn't give them enough time to break and they end up hitting me. And so um, it wasn't a hard hit, it was, you know, it wasn't that much of a hard hit because we had just gotten off a red light and uh, we both pulled over and then the, um, um, as soon as um, I got out the car, you know, to make sure everybody was all right, the first question that I asked, um, it was a young man, African-American man and, his, and uh, a woman. And the first thing that I asked them was um, whether they, they were all right. And, you know, they responded, yeah, are you all right? You know, so it was a bit, you know, they were a bit upset. There were a lot of, they were really upset. And so, um, you know, eventually what happened was is that uh, the young man, you know, basically was telling the woman who was with him, who happened to be his mother, to go back into the car. And basically, um, you know, he basically was saying that, um, you know, he was basically, you know, saying that he wanted me to write him a check. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm busy trying to go and get the insurance, you know, that's on my phone, it's in, it's in one of the apps. And I'm basically saying I have insurance, I don't have, you know, I don't, I can't write you a check. And then he immediately started saying, you know, we're gonna have to fight. So he started taking off his chain, and so, you know, it didn't make sense to me because this is what happens. You know, you get an accident, you know, it was a mistake, it was an accident. And so we exchanged information. And so, um, you know, that was his immediate response was to, you know, you know, we're gonna have to fight. And so, um, you know, right, right at the moment that, um, you know, I kind of felt like he was getting a little bit more aggressive, a police officer came up. And so um, his response was, you know, the police officer um, he didn't care that the police officer was there. And then the police officer got out the car and, you know, said, you don't care that I was here, you know? So anyway, the um, the point is, is that the police officer was able to arrest that anger. And then, you know, we were able to exchange information and that was it. Um, and so, you know, part of what I'm trying to get at is that, um, you know, oftentimes um, in our community, you know, there's a lot of people who um, are vulnerable. And more importantly, there are a lot of people who just really don't know you know, how to approach things, how to do things, and, and more importantly, how they feel and how to process those feelings. Because overall, you know, throughout the years, we, um, you know, have this, um, you know, we don't have this, um, this, this uh, ability to process things in a way that is productive and effective. And so, um, you know, part of what I think has to happen is that there has to be a little bit more of um, some, some overall, some overall some overall, you know, discussion regarding how we process information and how we are able to get through certain things without there being violence. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to um, ask, um, you know, the judges here today, um, in part because, you know, our police system um, has not always been in the best light. Now, I want to give, um, I want to give the cop the credit, but I was in a position where that could have gotten out of control. But because the police officer was there, it did not get out of control. And so not everybody's that fortunate and not everything, you know, not everything happens that way. In fact, there's, there's a lot of instances in, when that, in, in which that doesn't happen. And so, um, so you know, we, we, we have some work to do in terms of how uh, more people are able to, um, in underserved communities, be able to process those things 
without it resolve, resolving the violence. And so, um, we, you know, we, we're not necessarily, you know, sure whether we can actually say that we're ready to do that, um, particularly when it comes to policing in underserved communities. And so the question that I wanna ask you guys is um, will you commit to refuse to accept campaign donations from any police back organizations or political action committees? Because I don't think we've worked through the process in which we're able to um, you know, successfully say that we're, um, we're able to do that. Thank you, Asad. The question is, will you refuse to take money from police back groups? And so we have, I see nine yeses and see nine yeses. Thank, there's, but there are 10 folks. I think there are 10, I can't see all of them. So I apologize. I see nine yeses, but I know that there are to be 10 uh, candidates on here. Um, so Betsy Wall, we see yes. Michelle Hangley, we see yes. John Padova, we see yes. Wendy Barish, we see yes. Chris Hall, we see yes. Craig Levine, we see yes. Nick Kamau, we see yes. Michael Lambert, we see yes. Sherry Cohen, we see yes. And someone just me messaged and said that Mr. Yorgi Gurdy is not pinned at the front, but is saying yes. So those who are recording the answers, we have a unanimous yes that's being stated. If there are if there are nothing nothing's to shift, let's move on. To, first of all, thank you, Assad, for lifting that up and asking that question. We appreciate you. We're going to move now into our second question. Um, can we go ahead and pull up Jenna Henry? Jenna Henry from Free the Ballot. You got a question for us? Yes, I do. Hello, uh, my name is Jenna Henry. I am a formerly incarcerated activist and statewide organizer with Free the Ballot. Um, and I just have a question for you uh, in regards to jury nullification. Um, so there are two parts to this question. Do you agree that jurors can't be punished for the verdict they reach in a case and thus jurors have the right to acquit defendants for any reason, including the belief that the crime they, the defendant is charged with is unjust? Okay. Betsy Wall. Yes. Michelle Hangley. Yes. John Padova. Yes. Craig Levine. Yes. Chris Hall. Yes. Wendy Barish. Yes. Nick Kamau. Yes. Michael Lambert. Yes. Sherry Cohen. Yes. And again, uh, for those that are unaware, we do have the capacity to hold nine people pinned in the section, but not 10. So there's gonna always be one out and our tech, our Zoomologist is gonna do the best they can so that other folks can see, but we are having uh, direct involvement. We thank you for your patience. Um, okay, and the, the second part of that question is- I ask that, um, did we have a report for Michelle, I mean, uh, for um, Greg, uh, Yorgi Gertie. Did we have an answer for that one? If someone could just message me and let me know if they got a yes, it was a yes. All right, we got a yes. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Okay, great. And so then the next part of the question is, do you commit to instruct jurors in your courtroom of their right to acquit for any reason the jurors deem just? May I, may I address that? These are yes and no answers. And so we won't be doing any addressing in this section. There will be an open response section later in the uh, discussion tonight, but these are just yes and no. Oh, okay. I, I guess th there's a legal issue here in terms of what the law is. So, I, so I do appreciate you, Brother Hall. Thank you so much. We, but we're just in this call, this right here, we're just asking for yes and no with your sign. So let's begin the role here. Uh, Betsy Wall, yes. Michelle Hangley, no. John Padova, yes. No answer yet from Craig Levine. No answer yet from Chris Hall. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm with Chris on this. This is this is you're you're talking about judges instructing the jury. That's I, I, appreciate your, I appreciate your explaining. Unfortunately, we're just looking for a yes or no. I don't please. I don't mean to be unkind. Just want to make sure that we get through this. Uh, Wendy Barish says yes. Nick Kamau says yes. Michael Lambert says yes. Sherry Cohen says yes. And is does anyone have uh, Greg um, as well? Mr. You're already, yes, yes, okay. And so we're, we have right now no response noted for, for Craig and Chris. Uh, they do have something to say. We, this is a yes and no section. So we're gonna continue on with the questions. There's no response from Chris uh, Hall or Craig Levine. Number three, this is a question around immigration. So we're gonna call it Miguel Bacho from ICE out of courts. Miguel? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel. Uh, I represent I, I represent ICE out of courts, and I work with the immigrant community as a victim advocate. And my question is: uh, Will you support the court instituting a uniform policy prohibiting court personnel from contacting ICE, immigration and customs enforcement, and discouraging? ICE arrests on core property without a judicial signed warrant. Gregory Yorgi Gurdy, yes. Nick Kamau, yes. Michael Lambert, yes. Sherry Cohen, yes. Betsy Wall, yes. John Padova, Yes. Wendy Barish. Yes. So we are, are, are these the only folks that are going to respond? Oh, I see up, up top. Oh, forgive me. Oh, I'm now also navigating the screen as well. Michelle Hangley. I see a yes. I, I see Chris Hall. I see a yes. I see Craig Levine. I see a yes. I believe that was all 10. All right. Awesome. And our final question for this round uh, is a question on bail, a question on bail. Let's have the Reverend Art Brown from Powers Live Free Team to come. Reverend Brown. All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. On May 18th, 2021, the residents of Philadelphia will go to the polls to elect a district attorney and a municipal and common police court judges. Powers Ending Mass Incarceration Team has prepared an election voters guide to inform and prepare its congregations to vote for judges who will treat fairly those who have harmed and who have been harmed. Judges, we hope, who will be purveyors of mercy and accountability and not purveyors of the current unjust bail system that overtaxes the poor at higher rates than those who are not poor, thereby creating a human resource for incarceration. So my question is, do you believe anyone should be jailed because they are poor? I'm loving the energy. I'm loving the energy. Greg Yorgi Gurdy says no. Nick Kamau says no. Michael Lambert says no. Sherry Cohen says no. Betsy Wall says no. John Padova says no. Chris Hall says no. Michelle Hangley says no. Wendy Barish says no. And Craig Levine says no. We thank you for engaging uh, in this section uh, to allow our, our representatives from the community to ask you very direct questions and to get very direct answers. It is our desire to make sure that we get clarity and there's a lot of work that goes into planning this, that it runs smoothly and we get what we're looking for. And so we thank you for your willingness to accommodate us uh, in some of our asks. Thank you so, so much. This is now the section where uh, we're gonna move into political education uh, with our friend and brother Malik Neal from Philadelphia Bail Fund. Let's receive Brother Malik as he comes. Holidays around the world. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Reverend Nick. Um, yeah, my name is Malik. I use he, him pronouns. I think, uh, I think it says my where I'm from here, but South Philly. But um, I work with the Philly Bail Fund and have been asked to talk briefly about bail. And I try to keep it very brief, but sort of what is bail, why it needs to be abolished, and where we go from here. And I actually think it's important when we talk about bail that we not begin in the abstract, uh, that we not begin with data, though that's important, and no offense to the lawyers here, but that we not begin with legal language, though that's important as well. I think it's important when we talk about bail that we actually sort of strip it to its core. And you know, early last year, um, I was watching bail hearings in Philly. They happen 365 days a year, every four hours, and they normally last about two minutes. Uh, and there was a 17 year old kid and you can tell he really had trouble hearing what was happening in the hearing, even though the decisions made in that room impacted him the most. And after reading the charges, uh, the magistrate set the bail at $25,000. And I, there was a silence in the room and the kid finally spoke up and he asked the judge, he said, judge, I can't hear what you're saying but can you again tell me what my price is? And I often think of that because to me, I don't think that kid was trying to make a political statement, but I think in asking that question, I think he captured so precisely what cash bail is. I often say that cash bail is the ransom that the criminal legal system requires you pay for your freedom. And every day in Philly, our system says that you or your loved one can go home if only you cough over a couple hundred or thousand dollars. And the result is that hundreds of people in our Philly jails are sitting there uh, convicted of no crime, but an inability to pay for their freedom. And the reason for that is simple, right? The overwhelming majority of people our legal system arrests, prosecutes and, and detains are black and poor. Um, and so we know already the collateral consequences of the cash bail. We know that if you're held on bail, you're more likely to plead guilty. Uh, we know that just three days incarcerated can result in the loss of housing, jobs, custody of children. We know that bail doesn't keep us safe, but actually perpetuates the very drivers of violence and crime that it at least says that it hopes to prevent. And we know that with COVID, incarceration could mean life or death. So last year, bail was set in 49% of cases in Philadelphia. And we did the numbers and found out that Philadelphia had spent $30 million in bail last year. I mean, just think about that, $30 million that can be spent on schools, can be spent on our communities, can be kept in those families that need it most. And so why do we still have this system? Um, it's in part because judges make these decisions every day. They decide whether a person can go home uh, or go to jail, they decide that whether or not a person based on what's in their bank account can be detained. And so the way I see it is we really have a choice. We can continue with this system that results in people being detained based on what's in their bank accounts, that results in black and brown people being disproportionately detained pretrial in our jails. Or we could use a different system that really protects the presumption of innocence uh, that relies on pre-child incarceration as the exception and not the rule. Um, and I just want to say too, all of this has to be guided in pre-trial freedom. I notice everyone said they're against ending cash bail, but if we simply end cash bail but detain the same amount of people, then that's not going to do us any good. Uh, so to me, really, this movement about cash bail is ultimately about um, about freedom. It's about freedom for that kid I mentioned, about freedom for our communities. And that really is what has to guide us in this work. So, uh, so let's end cash bail uh, and let's bring our people home. Thank you, Malik, for offering this and helping us to get clear and understand what we're doing. I hope folks are listening in and, and taking note. Uh, this is good insight and good wisdom. We're having a fabulous discussion tonight. We're about to move into our open-ended question section, but before that, just so grateful to see the number of folks that have that are joining with us just here on Zoom by itself. 
We're at 147 people who are watching right now in this Zoom uh, chat. That's nothing, says nothing of the folks who are watching by Facebook Live. And so uh, we're thankful for all of the folks. We see folks from Queen Village, from Southwest Philly. We got some Point Breeze folk in the house. We see West Philly's in the house. Mount Aries and in, in Brewery Town folks in the house. Roxbury Maniac is being represented tonight. East Falls and Strawberry Mansion. Folks from Center City, Philadelphia, as well as Lawncrest and Graduate Hospital. Um, we see a number of folks uh, from, from all over the city. So, so thankful uh, for all of you that are here tonight. Uh, also, you have heard from uh, a number of, of organizations uh, that have been represented tonight already. Folks from the Working Families Organization, the Working Families Party, folks from Free the Ballot, a dynamic organization, folks from Ice Out of Courts, as well as from Power Live Free, shouts out to all of you for your commitment to community work and to making sure that we all get free. Amen. Um, let's move now into our open-ended questions. I know in our last round, uh, we were, uh, there were some questions that were lifted up that folks had, were a little bit challenged to answer uh, clearly yes or no. This is now the appropriate time for us to be able to elaborate or elucidate more uh, on the questions that are coming to you. Uh, this is the point where uh, we would like to, to ask you uh, to use two minutes, two minutes each to give your response for each of the following questions. So we don't wanna do any revisiting of former questions. We want you to answer the question that's being asked to you. And we, you're giving you, we're giving you two minutes uh, to answer those questions. Uh, you will be given a 10 second warning before your time is up. And um, I do wanna make sure that we stay on time. Uh, uh, time is precious and we are so thankful for the folks that are lending their energy and their time for another Zoom meeting. I know a lot of us are probably Zoomed out. So we wanna make sure that we are keeping this thing tight uh, uh, and, and respecting all those who are investing uh, their, their, their time tonight. So again, you'll get two minutes uh, to uh, answer your questions and we'll give you a 10 second warning before your time is up. If you do continue to speak past the two minute mark, our Zoomologist will have to mute you. And again, we don't mean to be unkind. I don't mean to sound unkind. We just wanna make sure that we are keeping things decently and in order, all right? So uh, we're gonna have uh, the first two questions coming up from the Philadelphia Bail Fund and then uh, from Reclaim Philadelphia. But let's move now into our open-ended questions, and we're going to call up now a question related to the teaching we just heard, the information, the political education we just received from Brother Malik Neal. We're going to talk a little bit about bail. So D. Hargrove from the Philadelphia Bail Fund has a question that they would like to propose to the candidates. D. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for all being on. Um, my name is D. Hargrove. I represent the Philadelphia Bell Fund. Um, I was incarcerated actually last year and the Bell Fund bailed me out at a $1,010 bail. Um, I couldn't afford it. I was one of those poor, poor folk. Um, just like my cousin, Rodney Hargrove, who was recently killed at CFCF prison about a week ago inside the parking lot of the prison. And his bail was set at $200,000 bail. He was 20 years old and he was shot 10 times and is under investigation currently. And for many people like myself, I was locked up actually during COVID. I saw a lot of unsanitary conditions and I spoke at city council in regards to that. Um, there was things that were challenged. And right now you all just answer no to the question about anyone being jailed because they are poor. Will you commit to eliminating cash bill in your courtroom? And if so, how? Just for clarity's sake, we do see a number of folks raising hands and things like that. We encourage you to use your reaction button to raise your hand and we'll call on you uh, as I see them. So first up to answer the question, we'll call on Chris Hall. Chris? Mr. Hall, we are unable to hear you as you are muted. Got it. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. Malik um, and 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 D. First of all, um, Malik, phenomenal summary. Um, and D, um, this this is how it works, and as a very practical matter, and how judges can end cash bail. There are only two lawful grounds to deny someone in their freedom before trial. One is that they pose 
a serious risk to the community. And the second is that they're a risk of flight. And you know, the sheriffs and the marshals, they're good at what they do. They can find people. There is really no reason to detain someone because of a perceived risk of flight. Um, I don't buy that. So as a judge, a way to end cash bail is to not buy the concept of a risk of flight. That's just, except in unusual circumstances of wealthy people with passports, you're not, you're gonna be able to find anyone you need to find. So that's one practical way to end cash bail. The second only, the other lawful grounds for bail is that there's a danger to the community. So if somebody, if there's evidence that someone is a, a real danger to the community and that there's no less intrusive way, for example, a stay away order, uh, an ankle bracelet, home confinement, those are all alternatives that a judge can use instead of uh, imposing cash bail. So uh, judges can just be much more discerning and, uh, and, much, uh, and adhere to the spirit and the letter of the law. And that's the way to end cash bail and limit bail. If somebody's a danger to the community, well then no, there should be no cash bail amount, uh, no matter how wealthy they are because they're a danger to the community. But short of that kind of non-custodial- 10 seconds. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Chris. We appreciate your, Mr. Hall, we appreciate your, um, your response. Let's go now to, to, to Betsy Wall. Betsy. Hello, okay. I definitely can commit to um, not using cash bail. And let me say this, um, I work, I've worked for the last 20 years in juvenile delinquency court. We do not use bail. Um, we do address the two issues that make a decision um, as to whether kids need to stay in custody before trial. And they are what um, Mr. Hall said, a danger to the community or a flight risk. We have been successful in juvenile court by not using any bail whatsoever, either holding a child because they are a serious danger to the community, probably involving guns and gangs, or all the rest of the kids are out in the community with various pretrial opportunities, such as in-home detention, mentorship programs, alternative school programs, um, all kinds of things that allow us to make sure that these kids are supervised and doing fine. We have an over 90% success rate with those kids not committing further crimes while waiting for trial and not running and showing up for their court dates. So I believe strongly that we could take that model and use it all over the adult criminal system with great success. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you so much, Ms. Wall. Let's go now to Craig Levine. Craig? Thanks, Nicholas. Um, first of all, cash bail uh, criminalizes poverty, and that's unacceptable. Um, I know this all too well. I represent a woman, Brianna Mack, who was wrongfully accused of a robbery um, in Delaware County. They had video evidence that she didn't commit the robbery because the robber was a man. She's a woman, a gay woman, and she was uh, ID'd by the, the clerk in the store who had given her a hard time for being gay. So she spent 10 months of her life in jail. And when you think about that, she lost 10 months of her life wrongfully accused because she couldn't make bail. So I understand all too well how cash bail will criminalize poverty. It has to be used in very, very rare and limited circumstances as Chris Hall laid out so elegantly. Thanks, Chris. Um, and especially in the time of COVID, when people in there, I work with Penny McDonald um, on the board of a reentry program. And what Penny and I have been trying to do is get people out of jail because they're getting sick. Some of them are dying from COVID. Um, and this again is criminalizing poverty. These are people that can't make bail. So I, I'm against it, except in very, very limited and rare circumstances. And I just wanna say, I'm sorry for your loss. I did see, um, on TV, on the news, that shooting outside CFCF, and um, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate that. Um, let's go now to Michael Lambert. Michael. Hello, everyone. At the end of the day, we are not here as judges to judge people based on their pockets. 
we're here to judge them on their character and the crime that they have committed. At first, most of the, this cash bill issue first needs to be addressed with the legislatures. But as judges, as a municipal court judge, that's, that's what I'm going for. I will be uh, or a future municipal court judge. I'll be dealing with mostly uh, 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 simple possession cases and things of that nature. Folks, if folks, if, if the people in front of me need to be in a uh, rehab program, that's where they need to be. If they, if they cannot afford the bail, they should not be in a position where they're required to pay money to get out of jail. Just as Craig Levin and Chris Hall and the other candidates have said, it's a travesty for us. I, I grew up poor. I grew up with, with no heat in the house and, 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 you know, landlords knocking on our door. And if unfortunately I was picked up as a young black man and thrown in jail for something I didn't do, I wouldn't be able to pay for that. And I, that cannot happen anymore and will not happen in my courtroom. It's just not going to happen. If I have to exercise some kind of uh, bail, I would preferably use uh, house arrest which is what I fight for a lot now as a criminal defense lawyer, which I've started from the public defender's office all the way up to my private practice right now. So house arrest is a lot easier with the ability to go out and work. We want to make people better. Ten seconds. Lock them up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. We appreciate you. Michelle Hangley. Cash bail is, it's a travesty. It keeps people from, it, it disrupts their lives, punishes them before they're found guilty of any crime. And it makes it so much harder for people to defend themselves. They can't meet with their lawyers. They can't prepare a defense. They can't speak to witnesses. I, I would not impose cash bail, except in the rarest of circumstances. And we're talking about people with passports and homes in other countries, that sort of a situation. I, I would also work to make sure the cash bail is imposed, you know, that other judges, other courtrooms are looking at what the rules really are for cash bail. They have been abused and judges are not taking into consideration the factors that they're supposed to take into consideration. So that's, I, I would work on it in my own courtroom and I would try to work on it across the court system. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I want to want to just thank all of you for my uh, allowing me to pronounce your names the way I have. If I have mispronounced any of your names at this point, I know we're about forty seven minutes into the into the forum. Please let me know. I'll do the best I can to uh, uh, to adjust that. Again, apologies if I have mispronounced anyone's names. Thank you, Michelle, for your answer. Let's go now to Wendy Barish. Wendy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, my issue with cash bail, I agree with what the other candidates have said, but to me, it is the result of systemic and institutional racism and discrimination. This is the end product of what we're seeing. This is people rendering a verdict about you before you ever even enter a courtroom. The, the entire system is offensive in how it's administered. And I understand, and I agree that there are limited circumstances, but what has been developed out of the system as it exists is just the product of institutional discrimination. Thank you, Wendy. Much appreciated. Let's go now to Greg Yorgi Gerdy. Greg. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I kind of I want to elaborate a little bit on or agree with with Wendy. Uh, first of all, I'm running for representation. It's not enough people in the courts or judges that look like me. Uh, I think we need to take people as they are. I know often uh, just by my skin color, I'm automatically judged. There are also diversionary programs that we can use. We need to stop trying to incarcerate people and try to lift people up. So we need to take each case individually and actually listen to the defendants. Cash bells not only hurt the defendants, but it hurts the family. I know people in my community as a Democratic committee person that, you know, some people have to mortgage their homes or lose their homes just to get that money to get people out. And I think that that's a horrible thing. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you so much. Let's move now to Sherry Cohen. Sherry. 
Hello, everyone. Um, first, D, I just want to say I'm so sorry to hear about um, uh, your cousin, and I just want to give my deepest condolences to you on that on that tragic uh, killing of your cousin. So, um, you know, my my heart is with you. Um, bail is part of the entire uh, criminal justice system that needs to be massively transformed. It is racist, it is classist, uh, bail must be abolished. And the other systems like risk assessment, electric monitoring, these are also, uh, you know, very racist and classist as well. So we have to really be careful about um, looking at alternatives to bail that may be also uh, as um, you know as uh, prejudicial and uh, biased and uh, racist and classist as bail is as well. Um, now bail is often set by bail magistrates, uh, but the court um, as a whole also gets to vote on. Um, on these, on these magistrates. So I think that is an, another important role of, the, uh, you know, uh, of judges. Uh, um, and um, I just think bail is a good place to start in this conversation because it's how people, you know, uh, first experience uh, or one of the first experiences of the injustices of the system. But yeah, we have to abolish it and we have to be careful of what we talk about when we uh, talk about replacing it with so with something else. Thank you, Sherry. Much appreciated. We're going to go now to John Padova. I do want to just flag that if there are if there is if Nick Kamau, I think is the only one uh, whose name I do not see. Uh, Nick, if you are wanting to answer the question, I don't see your name. So we're going to go to John first, and that'll give you a chance to to, uh, to prepare to answer if you so choose. So let's go to John Padova. John. John, you're muted. Good evening. I'm a Judge John Padova, and I've been sitting on the bench for a short time since the end of January of 2020. And um, what I see in my courtroom first, that the bail commissioners, they set the bail. And then there's bail modification petitions that are filed by the lawyers. And what I see in the cash bail system is really a, a travesty. It, the bail system, the cash bail system really penalizes underprivileged the marginalized community, people of color unfairly and keeps them in a jail unnecessarily. Oftentimes they lose their jobs, sometimes they lose their housing and sometimes they lose their children. So what I do when I see bail modifications, I look at that closely and I work to see if there's solutions so I can get them out of jail, okay? Uh, such as uh, house uh, detention or things of that nature and try and get them into some type of diversionary program, maybe if they have a, uh, uh, a drug problem or some type of medical, um, uh, medical condition, uh, use those programs instead of uh, locking them up unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. All right. We're going to, all right, Brother Nick, go ahead. All right, thank you so much. I didn't see, uh, I'm having a difficult time finding my uh, my reaction to raise my hand, but um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you know, I don't need to echo everything everyone else has said. Um, I think it's clear that we all agree the cash bail system is, uh, is inequitable, is uh, unjust, and it um, is especially discriminatory towards uh, low income and, and poor uh, individuals. Um, you know, the cash bail system was designed as a way not to keep people incarcerated, but rather was a way to ensure that people who were released uh, came back to their, their, their hearing, back to trial. Um, and, you know, like Chris Hall indicated, there's, you know, a number of criteria that uh, uh, the bail commissioners utilize. They use, you know, look at, you know, you know flight risk or, uh, you know, that can be equated to uh, previous failures to appear. Uh, so if someone failed to appear on a number of previous case, uh, occasions, then they will uh, place them at, at a higher flight risk or failure, uh, you know, risk of, uh, of not coming back to court. Uh, also, um, a danger to community. 
One of the things that they don't consider is ability to pay. Um, and, you know, you know, I don't think that we should be employing a, a cash bail system at all. I think we should go uh, the way of New Jersey as a, as a state uh, who uh, got rid of their cash bail system. But to the extent that we weren't uh, to, to totally get rid of it, we should go by the way of California, who uh, recently um, passed uh, legislation indicating that, you, that judges have to consider an individual's ability to pay. Um, to the extent that we can't, as a state, get there, um, then the judges uh, have the capacity to, of, of, to prevent uh, the use uh, of, of the cash bail system. And that's something that I will do. You know, when the cash bail system was, was first imposed, we didn't have the opportunity to, to do, uh, you know, court monitoring, ankle monitoring. Uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, supervised uh, pretrial release. Those are all things that we need to do. Um, and, you know, I think what happens is uh, not only are defendants um, uh, made more vulnerable, but communities uh, who are, are already vulnerable are made more vulnerable as a result of having to try to uh, come up with, with, with bail money. For Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamau. We appreciate that. All right. Substantive discussion is happening. We're hearing good answers. We're hearing type, all types of answers uh, from our candidates here tonight. Such substantive questions that are coming as well. We thank you, Dee, for your question. And I think I speak for a number of us when we also offer our condolences and our deepest sympathies. Thank um, you very much. Now, as we move away from this question around bail, we're moving now into a question around incarceration. And from Reclaim Philadelphia, we have Christian Fuentes, who is going to lead us in this question. Christian? Hi. Uh, so yeah, I'm a Reclaim member a student at Temple University. And I know a thing or two about, I was under the impression that this is gonna be about state supervision, particularly parole, uh, probation. Am I, are we on the same page? Your question is the right question. Cool. So um, I was in prison for three years and I've been on parole for two years and I still have three more years left uh, on my state supervision to complete. I have a friend who just came home. He was in prison for nine years he has 11 years left on parole. So his, his, his sentence was a nine to 20. Um, and after that nine to 20, he has 20 years of special probation on top of all that. Um, we're not a threat to society yet. We can't see each other. Uh, conditions of parole, probation, we can't see each other. That's a violation. Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, it's different, but imagine if you as judges couldn't see anyone you went to law school with. The camaraderie, all the, the good times, it, it's just, it's void. We, we deem you can't see each other. That's not appropriate. I have a strong support system in place, but most people under state supervision aren't as lucky as me, and they have a hell of a time finding housing and employment because of the supervision or, the, you know, they're deemed a felon. Uh, for many of us, the constant threat of incarceration attached to our supervision has a detrimental effect on our mental health. We're told we're free, but we know better. We know we're still property of the state. So that being said, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer, one in 23 adults in Philadelphia are on probation or parole, which is the highest rate of any big city. Pennsylvania is also one of the leading states in probation tales, sentencing many people to probation for 10 years or more after a jail sentence. What would you do to curb Philadelphia's problem with mass supervision? So again, we're, our request is that if you that you, that you raise or use your reaction, put a hand up, let us know. Uh, I understand, Mr. Kamal, that yours is not necessarily working, but all those who can, uh, please put your hand up uh, through your reaction. Just a reminder again that you have two minutes to respond to this question. And at the 10 second mark, uh, Katya Perez will come on and, and give you the 10 second warning, in which case uh, we will be uh, on the button on 10, on 10 seconds and we'll have to mute you if you were still talking. Again, we thank you for your, your willingness to, to accommodate us in our requests. Let's jump right in. Wendy Barish. I think that the first thing you need to do is when people have served their time, the system needs to be restorative and stop being punitive. I also have a, people, a father who has a record and because of how he's been treated and what happened, I've had to support him at various times in his life to avoid him being homeless. 
the court, right as it stands right now, is not even using the available programs that I know exist. I know that there's a program because at PHA, we have a program with the court to allow the court to refer people back to housing who might otherwise be not qualified due to the record. We've gotten no cases, that's zero in three years. There are systems in place to enable people to get back successfully to reintegrate into society and they are not being used. When you use the parole and probation system to punish people, all you're doing is giving them the pathway back to the jail system. So you need to focus as a judge on what can you do to help this person integrate successfully into society, which means for them to get back to housing, for them to be able to get employment, to utilize the social services that are out there so that you can help this person successfully return to society and take a restorative approach and realize that the punishment ends when that person leaves. And this needs to change. There are systems in place to do this. They are not using them. Thank you, Wendy. Let's go to Nick Kamau. Nick. Thank you. Uh, so th the first thing is, uh, you know, the probation system creates this revolving door uh, where an individual completes their sentence and they are sentenced to a, a probation tail or a pro even if they, they just receive a probationary sentence uh, for a nonviolent offense. Um, it's very, very difficult for people to successfully complete probation. So what judges really ought to do is not look at whether someone uh, has uh, looking at probation in terms of compliance with probation. Like if you haven't complied with the terms of probation, uh, then I'm going to violate you. Judges ought to be looking at whether the individual uh, has um, is on the right track, uh, is, is moving forward towards full integration, is, is moving forward in, in terms of uh, making themselves better is moving forward in terms of uh, helping to make the community better. But if someone has a you know has a contact high and, and has a dirty urine, uh, but they're they're holding on a job, they're doing all of the other things that they need to do. Compliance isn't the objective, right? The objective um, is is not not reoffending. The objective is uh, restoration. We want to restore people. And that's what it was kind of designed as, but that's not where we are. The other thing is, P, we, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, different kind of probation officers. We have some who are really good, uh, who do a great job of making sure that the people who are on their probation are, are being successful. Uh, but we have a lot of probation officers who are looking to jam people up, who are looking to catch people in failing, you know, in, in violating their probation, who uh, aren't working with their probation or to try to make them better. Well, you know, that's what we really need to do. We, there are some uh, community organizations, some community probation supervision uh, 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 operations uh, where people actually care and they're social workers who are trying to make people better. And that's what we need to, to move towards. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Right on the button. Much appreciated. Let's go now to John Padova. John? Thank you for the question. In, in my view, uh, long periods of probation that are set uh, basically set up individuals to fail where they, end, where, where they generally end up back in jail or back in the criminal system. So I'm a proponent of uh, shorter probationary periods. But also uh, what I do is I like to monitor the person that's still on probation. And if he's complying with the terms of the probation, I'll reduce the, 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 the probation or get, a, get him off of probation. Also, I also make sure I get the person into a reentry program. Um, we have to establish more comprehensive reentry programs to provide employment opportunities to uh, offenders who are on a probation. So we make connections with potential employers and provide vocational financial and life skills training in these reentry programs. That's what I try and do. In fact, there's a, a program called a branching up, which I try and get the people that are, are on probation involved with. And that is where they're um, basically trained by people at uh, uh, Penn in, in landscaping and uh, providing them with uh, tools to become a, a landscaper along with other life skills. And if they're compliant with that, I shorten the time of probation and try and get them out of the system 
so they can link up with a potential employer. Those are my feelings with regard to probation. Thank you, Judge. Let's move now to Gregory Yorgi-Gurdy. Well, you know, in my, in my opinion, probation, like 10 year probation is akin to incarceration in my opinion. I think what we need to do is have community engagement while incarcerated. First of all, I think we should, that's a, while incarcerated, we should have community engagement to get employment uh, when these defendants get out of jail, uh, employment, uh, job opportunities, mental health uh, concerns need to be addressed, uh, addiction, uh, those things need to be addressed, and also families. Uh, some of these families are torn apart. We need to address those. So when they <clears throat> get out of incarceration, they have something to, to, to have to work for and have a, a standing grand, uh, a ground to walk on. I think that's really, really important. Uh, I'm really against incarceration, period. But if that does happen, we need to institute those plans so that when the incarcerated gets out, that they have at least a chance to get back into society and be successful. Thank you. Betsy Wall. Um, I will commit that no one that comes before me will be burdened by excessive lengths or conditions of probation or parole. I feel strongly that micromanaging people is demoralizing. It's excessively restrictive and definitely a setup for failure. Um, again, I have to refer to my 20 years of experience running a courtroom in juvenile court. A typical probationary sentence is six to nine months, not years. A typical length of uh, parole, so to speak, or a probation after someone comes out of placement is three to six months, not years. We have been extremely successful. All the evidence-based studies show that there is a point of diminishing return. So again, I would commit to that in juvenile court and hope that those theories can extend to the adult system as well. Thank you, Betsy. Michelle Hangley. Um, I mean, first of all, unfortunately, this is primarily a legislative problem. Uh, Pennsylvania has some, some of the most harsh uh, probation and parole rules in the country. Uh, so advocacy is important, and to some extent that can come from judges. I know that your groups are doing that, um, but to some extent judges' hands are tied. But certainly in a courtroom, I would commit to imposing the, the least and least restrictive amount of probation that is that is necessary or that is appropriate. We have to get past the idea that long, long supervision and harsh terms of supervision is helpful. It is not helpful to the people being supervised. As, as Betsy Wall said, it's demoralizing. It's harmful to their families. It makes them more likely to reoffend, And it makes their lives you know, not quite complete and not what they should be, although they've already served, served their sentence. So I would work to both minimize the amount of, of these sentences that I myself impose, to advocate to the extent that it's appropriate uh, for ending the system that we have now, and to trying to spread to other judges into the whole system the idea that the way that we're doing things now, it's not helpful, it's not necessary, and it should change. Thank you, Michelle. Chris Hall? Betsy Wall hit the nail on the head. The criminologists have studied this, and the, it is clear. Short sentences, just as effectively as long sentences, achieve all the goals of sentencing. So you begin with the end in mind. You start with a short sentence, and then upon uh, a successful completion of reentry, you shorten the tail further, as uh, Judge Padova recommended. And I'd like to give Christian just a piece of uh, unsolicited uh, advice. I recommend that you go to your judge. You are a success story. You are at Temple University. You are a judge's dream in terms of rehabilitation and a productive uh, con contributor to society. If uh, you came before me and asked me to modify your conditions so that you could um, be with your friend and be a positive influence in your friend's life, I would do that in a New York second. So don't give up and go back to the judge. And finally, um, 
Jenna Henry, I'd like to circle back to your question about jury nullification. It was a great question. It is important that juries retain the ability to do what's right and just. The only reason I hesitated about the instruction that you asked for was I would hate to see a jury use that for uh, racist or sexist reasons. In other words, if you free a jury to render a verdict based on racist or sexist principles, that's the opposite of what we want. So yes, no jury should be ever punished for um, rendering a verdict of not guilty because they think there's some unjust uh, purpose, but judges must instruct juries that they should abide by the law in rendering that verdict. And then they're free to do whatever they want. Thank you, Chris. We're gonna go now to Michael Lambert. Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, Christian Frentis, I, I think it's a great position you're in to be at Temple University. Uh, that is my alma mater. I went to Temple undergrad and Temple Law School. It's a great school. Um, what I do wanna say at the end of the day is that uh, you are being unfairly punished. Um, this is, you know, if you were in my courtroom, you, I propose that in my courtroom that I will be looking at the, 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 the each and every uh, case and each and every person in front of me to see if I should terminate them. I would more than, what I would like to do is to have the people that are on my probation come before me more often than, than, than what's been uh, uh, occurring right now. And the reason why I would do that is because I wanna do a status check to see exactly what they're doing if they're doing it and doing it right. I don't wanna wait for the, the probation department to say, oh, this person messed up, they come in front of me and it's all negative. I think as judges, we can flip the script and make it a positive situation where we're checking on the clients constantly, see clients rather, I'm still speaking as a criminal defense lawyer, which I've been doing for 20 years, but the defendants or the individuals that are in front of me, we should be checking on how they're doing on a more consistent basis. And if they're doing well, we should terminate their probation. We should give them an opportunity to get off at a quicker rate. I do have a lot more to say, but I think that my time is running out. But the one thing I'd like to say is this, as judges, we, are, we have a role to make society better. We, are, we, are, uh, uh, we work for the state, we work for the, we, we, we are here, we are here kind of like social workers, but we're here to make the society better. One second. And, each and every individual. Again, I think that we should utilize our social programs more, vocational training, truck driving. These are things. Thank you, Michael. Let's go now to Craig Levin. Oh, I'm sorry, Sherry Cohen. Please forgive me. And then Craig after, after Sherry. Sherry? You're on mute. Okay. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, I think our probation and parole systems are horrendous, as I say, like the entire prison industrial complex, which needs to be abolished. Um, I, uh, people know, I think here, that Philly is among the most supervised jurisdictions in the nation. Um, and uh, the big problem that, as, as somebody mentioned, was that we are in a state uh, the state of Pennsylvania is one of the few states that fails to put any cap on the length of time people can be sentenced to probation. And uh, yet, and yet, and these sentences, so we have like Philly judges sentencing some people to decades of this kind of supervision. And it, it you know, it's, 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 it's really terrible. Um, and it's a major driver of reincarceration. Uh, the, the probation and parole system. So, and, and people are incarcerated, reincarcerated for technical violations. And, um, you know, that has to stop. So definitely in my courtroom, people would be given, you know, I think it would be given short uh, probation and parole sentences because, um, you know, it's part of the problem. And, uh, we need to create, change the current system and have a system of restorative justice um, and where it's about healing and um, it's about moving people forward in their lives, helping people stay free instead of helping people stay, um, you know, as 
as you know, part of the carceral state. 10 seconds. Thank you, Sherry. Let's go now to Craig Levine. Craig? Thanks, Nicholas. Um, I think right out of the box, Wendy Barish just hit it right on the head. It's about restorative, not punishment. If you're sentenced and, and you did your, your sentence and you're finished, you shouldn't be stuck with a long tail probation. It, it's just not fair. You shouldn't have to walk around on pins and needles and worry if you make a little mistake or if you go and you see a friend of yours. It, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You paid your debt to society. And then John Padova hit the nail on the head when he said, you got to use reentry programs. I'm partial to this because I've been a part of a reentry program. Community forgiveness and restoration. Forgiveness and restoration. And that's what we do there. And what I've seen more than anything is citizens who are coming back from incarceration, they want to do better with their life. And they respond to caring and kindness. And when you're out there and they know that you have their back and you're and they could depend on you, it makes a huge difference. And that's what the criminal justice system has to be about. That's what I'll be about as a judge. I'm not going to have these long tail probations looking to, to put people back in jail. I want them to uh, rehabilitate and go on and live a good life and, and go on the right track. And that's what it's about. And that's what our criminal justice system has to be about to be effective. Thank you, Craig. And that, that concludes our discussion for the first portion of our open-ended questions. We're gonna continue on uh, with a number of questions on the back end of our next piece here. Black Rat Medusa is gonna be coming to us now to offer a performance. We wanna break it up a little bit. We've had some robust discussion and the organizers of this event were thoughtful enough for all of you who are watching to make sure that we put a few moments of, uh, to allow us to digest and to, to, to reset from all that we have heard to be able to process what we have and so that we can put forward some more questions, have some more discussion. But, so before we go into that, we're gonna talk a little bit about family court. We're gonna talk about housing and immigration. We're gonna have some values and trauma questions that are coming uh, and we're excited about that. But first we need to hear from Black Rap Medusa. So without further ado, let's go ahead and transition now into our artist performance for tonight, Black Rap Medusa. Word, uh, peace and power, everybody. I uh, pray you all are well. Um, thank y'all for having me. Thank y'all for inviting me out um, and here to perform. I am Black Rap Medusa, that's B-L-A-K-R-A-P-P-M-A-D-U-S-A, -P -P making a difference using skills and activism. Um, I am the founder of Mary's Daughter for the Formerly Incarcerated and uh, president and uh, co-founder of the Dignity Act Now Collective. Um, make no mistake about it. I do not trust the criminal justice system. I've seen black, white, male, female, Asian, Latinx, all, all walks of life go in on my folks in the courtroom. So make no mistakes about it. I know that the criminal justice system is nothing but slavery and racism with another twist or another face. So I, I do not believe in it. Um, however, I hope that all of you um, stick to your guns and the way that you answer the questions. I pray that y'all, you know, actually go out here and, and do that and, and, and right some wrongs that has been done to, um, to black and brown people in America. Um, but let's get it started. Um, street flow assists. Yeah, blow a bit. No, I'm not controlling. Just trying to take a hold of it. Climbing up the pole. Yeah, go on. Take a hold of it. Bree new something. Bring new something. If you ain't scared, man, do something. Get gone, take the power back. Black is where the power's at. Back is that I'm fighting back. Using words, rhyme, predicate, verb. Now I'm swerving up on the curb, trying to get up out the left lane. My left brain trying to think about the right things. My right brain trying to write change. Just blowing no intermission. Knowing my intermission. Using my intuition. Don't suggest you go against it, huh? Wait, hold up. Start when I say Black Lives Matter, man. Y'all repeat the words. We say Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, we say Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, oh. I got Black pride in my system. Racism gonna be my victim. I got Black pride in my system. Patriarchy gonna be my victim. Who the victim? You the victim, they the victim. Ooh, who the victim? They the victim, you the victim. Ooh. 
Well, I just dab on them and pull a slab on them. Michael Jackson, Billy bad on them. We looking good, black fat on them. My black skin is trending. Check your followers and all who you're befriending. I'm lit to no end in one word. Winning, 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 winning. Well, check my cocky in your review mirror. I'm no contender, you cannot compare them. The end is coming, I can hear it nearer. And spit that black shit, make the world just fear up. It gets scary. Like a picture on the wall, I spot you down the hall. Make your skin begin to crawl as the spirit distance. Or you call it paranormal. The ancestor looking for, you call it paranormal. But ain't nothing about the system ever normal. Yeah, nothing about the system's ever normal. <laughs> I got black pride in my system. Racism gonna be my victim. I got black pride in my system. Patriarchy gonna be my victim. Who the victim? You the victim. They the victim. Ooh, who the victim? They the victim. You the victim. Yeah. <laughs> when I have to scream black pride and describe just what matters about black lives. As you say, all lives matter, but all lives ain't the same. All lies ain't the same. Well, I had to own my skin. 400 years, I couldn't say it. I had to <gasps> hold my knees. So now as I think about it and I hold my pen, I summon all my kin that drown in the Atlantic, left children frantic, running about looking for their mamas with papas who had forgot the language of papa. So in their honor, I slay black pride. I fried, die, lay to the side, straight slay black pride. I mega Evans and Emmett Till, straight slay black pride. I Ida B. Wells, Asada Shakur, straight slay black pride. I slay black pride. I slay black pride. I got black pride in my system. Racism gonna be my victim. I got black pride in my system. Patriarchy gonna be my victim. Who the victim? They the victim. You the victim. Who? Who the victim? They the victim. You the victim. Ooh. So that's just the first selection right there. And um, I did not put any beat to that because I want to make sure that you are actually listening to those words. Um, for all of y'all on here again, I've seen my folks railroaded by people that look just like me. So I'm not looking at it as as um, as we the same. I I hear y'all talking about the probation. I know those detainers. I did Black Mama bail out last year, uh, both in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh. And half of those people couldn't get out because of detainers, because of probation and parole detainers. So no, I'm not trying to hear nothing y'all talking about unless y'all freeing my folks. Liberation is the only way forward. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna get into this last piece. Um, and just thinking about the ancestors, thinking about where we come from, thinking about not just going back, we're going back beyond slavery, beyond all of that to, to where we actually came from. And so, uh, guess I'm gonna go, never gonna stop. So freedom is mine, United Black Power, Yoruba, Osa, Zulu, Swahili, please don't wake me if I'm Black Power dreaming. Yeah, don't wake me if I'm ancestor dreaming. Please don't wake me if I'm MLK dreaming. That's my mix, how I'm scheming. Ah, float like a butterfly, sting like a beat em. Ah, Muhammad, I lead them. My people follow, I lead them. I am the light, I'm the beacon. I am no politician, but I politic for their freedom. Now keep your votes, I don't need them. I am my sister's keeper, brother's equal. Write the sequel, first the Hebrew. Cut from Moses, Rosa, Joseph. Get this dose of blow, explosive, unapologetic, black, and I know it. Something like a prophet, bring that message in poems. Rip Biggie, Park, Nipsey, Dr. Sabi. Jafar, Benny, and Tamir, just babies. Sandra, Biana, Rakia, Ayana, Zipporah, Nazora, Aaliyah, they gone too soon. My fatty phone, this your ancestor tomb. My fatty phone, this your ancestor tomb. To my Orisha and they go, my fatty phone, this your ancestor tomb. Dream of a place that my ancestors from, running through the Serengeti straight to the sun, melanin that's baked in the sun. Imagining no rape, no racism. Recondition your mind, recondition your cognizance. Like water for chocolate, there's common sense. Fighting is our duty, that's what Asada said. Whether it's in Cuba or the Congo with Lumumba live. Black rap, boom by yeah. Put brass and boom back to hit the back of your medulla. Magician in the food, playing cards in Medusa. Head. When I walk in the room, my goon goon swoon like typhoons. When the smoke clears, what's there? Who there? It be platoons of the undead. No stone unturned, no words left unsaid. I'm the embodiment of those not judged yet. So I speak for the soul, as above and so below. Angels and demons advise on where to go. I'm the dreamer, I'm leading, I run a show. Yes, I'm gonna go. Yes, I'm gonna go. Never gonna stop. 
So freedom is mine. You're not a black pod. You're a bar. Osa. Zulu. Swahili. Please don't wake me if I'm black pop or dreaming. Yeah, don't wake me if I'm ancestor dreaming. Please don't wake me if I'm black pop or dreaming. Yeah, don't wake me if I'm ancestor dreaming. Yeah, yeah. That's it right there. Um, Y'all can catch me on the Instagram. B-L-A-K underscore R-A-P-P. Um, or you can check the Dignity Act page on Facebook, um, Dignity for PA. Uh, we're working on a bunch of legislation, so we would de definitely love for y'all to sign on. Dignity for incarcerated women, Dignity now, Dignity in the future, Dignity forever. Um, thank y'all so much, Reclaim. Shout out all the um, comrades from Reclaim, all the allies and co-conspirators on here. Uh, thank y'all for having me. Um, yeah, peace and power. I say, wanna just wanna just appreciate you. Black Rap Medusa came through with the insight, with the wisdom. I heard a whole bunch of nuggets in there, including yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our duty. That's what Asada taught us. So listen, uh, for those that have listened up, please understand uh, that the, th this imagination, this vision for a better world, for a freer world, uh, oftentimes you can find it in Freedom Fighters dreams, uh, like Black Medusa, uh, Black Rap Medusa has just lifted up. Don't wake her while she Black Power dreaming. We need to make sure that we're listening and hearing the wisdom and the insight. I want to do a quick plug, if that's all right, Reclaim, that for folks who are looking to try to get a vision for the future, check out and revisit Robin D.G. Kelly's Freedom Dreams. That's what you spread so sparked up in me as you were rapping. Make sure that we're reading and, and, and allowing ourselves to, to, to learn from those who are radical and imagining a free and a decarcerated world, a world where we don't need jails and prisons no more, a world where we don't need police no more, a world where we don't have to question whether or not judges are looking to make sure that folks are free, that we already know that in the first place. But we need to make sure uh, that we are staying connected to the types of things that Black Real quick, real quick, Nick, I just want to raise up the, the issue of of locking black mothers and caregivers up. Okay. What it's doing is it's devastating our communities. So I, I know that the judges wrote out some diversionary programs for black mothers who have been disproportionately kept out of those opportunities um, in the past. I, I, I understand that they're rolling out these different um, things, but since the opioid crisis has hit, there has been more um, folks um, from the other side speaking up about it. But when the crack epidemic hit and devastated the black and brown community, nobody stepped up to, to speak about that. And so I'm asking and I'm, I'm, I'm demanding that all of y'all, when you see a black mother or a caregiver in there, that you don't incarcerate her, that you don't take her children away from her, that you don't take her away from her community because it's devastating us. And if you don't want no more, you don't want no more shootings and killings, then go, then send, send, send these mothers home. How about that? Send these mothers home to be with their children and their families and their community because y'all devastating us. Thank y'all so much for having me. Peace. Let's hear the wisdom when it's being spoken. Oftentimes we don't we don't regard when our when our leaders and our our visionaries are speaking. The wisdom and the answers are there. As we say, the people who are closest to the pain or the problem are the ones who are closest to the solution. So I hope that our ears are wide, as they say, they that have an ear, let them hear what's being said. I hope that that, is, that, that that was received. So again, Ashe, thank you, Black Rap Medusa, for bringing your insights, your wisdom, your brilliance to this space, your artistry, which is also essential to any freedom movement. It is absolutely essential. Thank you so, so much. Listen, y'all, we want to jump back into this. I hope that was refreshing and enlivening for you, vitalizing for you, uh, the wisdom and the insight of the organizers to make sure that we we inserted a few things here or there to kind of keep this thing a little light was, was wise. So thank you for that. But now we're going to jump back into our conversation. We are returning back to our open-ended questions. Uh, we are continuing with that. Uh, we heard previously from, uh, from D. Hargrove, as well as Christian Fuentes from Philadelphia Bail Fund and Reclaim Philadelphia, respectively. Again, major shouts out to both of those organizations. Thank you, Reclaim, for even helping to provide this space tonight. This is major, major, major work that's being done uh, by community folks, grassroots community groups that are doing the work. Amen, I mean, and I mean. Um, let us uh, go into our first question. This question is around family court. And from 1PA, uh, one of the great organizations across the Commonwealth, we have Tynetta Eddins, who is gonna bring us our first question. Let me just say before they come, again, persons or uh, candidates have two minutes, two minutes to answer questions. At the 10 second mark, 
uh, or at, I guess at 10 seconds to the end, you'll receive a warning, a 10 second warning from Katia Perez. Uh, that will hopefully give you a chance not to not to stumble you up or or to trip you up, but just so that you know that you're drawn to a close here. And so you'll want to wrap up your, your, your comments at that point. Uh, if you go beyond that, then we'll have to go ahead and mute you. Again, we don't mean to be unkind. We just want to make sure that we keep it tight. All right. Again, thank you for the answers that you're providing. We're enjoying the conversation. Tynetta Eddins from 1PA. Hi. Um, a 2009 report from the National Coalition of Child, Child Protection Reform identified lack of housing as a factor in 11% of removals of children in Philadelphia and noted poverty factors into an even higher percentage of removals. How would you ensure that you are not terminating parental rights because of poverty? What would you do in place of terminating parental rights? What would you do in place of terminating parental rights? We hear the question. And so again, our ask is persons who are going to answer this question, if you'd like to answer this question, go ahead and, and hit your hand uh, uh, reaction. Put your hand up reaction if you can. I know that uh, Nick Kamal was unable to do that, but all, all others have demonstrated that they can. So go ahead and do that so we can, we, can, we can see you easily. And then we will get started. I just wait a few more seconds for, for other folks to raise their hands and then we'll jump in. Okay. Okay, I see them coming up now. I see them coming up now. All right, let us begin with Michael Lambert. Michael. Thank you so much. Now, I, I will be in the municipal court and I will not be doing a family court issue, but I'd still <laughs> like to share my personal opinion. I'm from a single family household. If you terminate the rights of my mother to take care of myself and my sister, I probably would not be sitting in front of you today. And a lot of my friends that I went to school with at Ada Lewis, Martin Luther King High School, probably have been in the similar position where their parents have been terminated. And a lot of those folks are not here with us today or they're incarcerated or did not have uh, 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 the opportunities that some of us have today. My personal opinion is that we should not be terminating parental rights unless it's absolutely necessary, where the child is being completely abused and neglected. Even then, I still believe that we can rehabilitate these parents and bring them back to a position where they can be healthy parents. We should not be writing individuals off because of their maybe drug abuse or issues like that. People can be rehabilitated. And I believe at the end of the day, if you were to terminate uh, individual rights, they'll be in the foster system. And I, no knock to the system, but I believe that each individual child should have a right to be uh, uh, raised or reared rather by their parents. And if we were to terminate those rights, I think we'll have a society that does not give us the proper benefits for the children to have a great life. No one will ever love me as much as my mother. And I believe that that's across the board. And if I was raised with a household with a mother and father, if you terminate either or both of them, it would devastate. 10 seconds. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Let's go now to Wendy Barish. Thank you. Um, as a product of a single parent household and being raised in the home of my grandparents, I can tell you, I know firsthand how important it is to keep parents in a child's life. If there are issues with the parents, the court and the judges should be looking at what is the core issue? What kind of programming can be done for these parents? And if they need to be separated, they should look for another family member that they can stay with so that they do not put that child in the system. Because once that child's in the system, it's very difficult to turn back. So I think the court needs to look at what is the problem? Is there a danger in that household? What is the source of that danger? See if you can put the parent into a treatment facility. See if you can put some kind of system in place where there's other family in a support system before you sever those rights. Because once you do and you take the children out of that household, it is really impossible to rebuild that connection after you do that. Thank you, Wendy, powerful answer. Can we go now to Gregory Yorgi Gurdy? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as Michael said, I'm running also for municipal court, but I'd like to give my own personal opinion and experience. Uh, my husband and I uh, created our family through the courts. We adopted uh, three beautiful children, but we also fostered several other kids. And we were also very friendly with mothers of those families. And our ultimate goal is the best interest of those kids. So we worked with those mothers and some of them had issues. They needed a hand up and we were there for them. And we're still friendly with them today. I think it's important for the courts to look at that. It's people out there like uh, LGBTQ plus uh, families that want to help out mothers who sometimes need a hand up and the courts need to look at that and be more active with that. And we were one of those, those uh, couples, fortunately. Thank you, Gregory. Can we go to Chris Hall? Can you hear me okay? Uh, um, I think Gregory just hit the nail on the head. Um, there's a, a young woman in my firm um, who I've mentored. Uh, she's a member of the L LGBTQ uh, community and um, she's she and her partner have become um, qualified uh, foster parents and um, they would be precisely the type of parent that uh, Gregory and his husband have been. Um, and, uh, and also though, the question posed was removal due to poverty. And if poverty is the issue, that shouldn't be an impediment. We just have to allocate resources and find resources. And finally, um, I think of all the candidates, uh, the person, the candidate who has the most experience in this is Betsy Wall. And so I'm, I'm gonna cede my time because I really look forward to hearing what her thoughts are. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Let's go now to Sherry Cohen. Sherry? Hello, am I? Okay, I'm not muted, great. So um, yeah, thank you for the question. You know, the, the court system as a whole is anti-Black in, in kind of every part of it. So like the same way the uh, criminal justice system, uh, criminal, criminal um, legal system or criminal punishment system, you know, exercises dis disproportionate control over uh, uh, the Black community, so does our family court system. Um, you know, um, in Pennsylvania in 2016, 43% of Black youth aged 14 and older in PA were in foster care uh, compared to one quarter of all youth that age across the US. So, um, yeah, the foster care system uh, too often as a question talks about uh, looks at neglectful parents, uh, uh, people they, they say are neglectful and it's really based on issues of poverty, lack of housing um, and you know, um, you know it, it's just, we cannot continue to do this in our family court system. Uh, it is disp disproportionately targeting black mothers um, and um, calling it maltreatment by the parents when it so often relates to conditions of poverty. So I think what we need to do is offer in-home supports to families to keep families together. So we have to find out the, in the supports that families need and um, we have to seek out kinship care. If it seconds. Okay, where, where removal is truly warranted, then kinship care, uh, you know, with a, another family member, not. Um... Thank you, Sherry, we appreciate that. Craig Levin. Thank you. Um, anytime you're dealing with the child, it has to be what's in the best interest of the, ch of the child. That's the, the ultimate goal here. Um, this is a problem that goes well beyond what a judge can do and what the courts can do, but it's very important for any judge for any court to utilize any social services that are out there. And I forget which candidate said it, um, to see if they have relatives. Um, a, a child has to have their mother and their father. It, it, it's in the best interest of the child. So the court always has to look at every possible solution before you get to that point where you're separating them. This. This city is a great city, but it has overwhelming poverty. And, and that's at the heart of all, of all this. You know, you have gentr gentrification where 
you know, people are getting pushed out of neighborhoods and in, in livable conditions. You have landlords that aren't providing, you know, livable spaces for, for people and for children. So it's really a systemic problem. But from a judge's perspective, you got to look at every possible way to keep a, a child together with their parents. Thank you so much. Let's go to Michelle Hangley. Michelle? So I think one a problem with our court system and our family court system is that it's too easy to do the wrong thing. It's too easy to look at a situation and say that's neglect when what you're looking at is poverty. And it's too easy to put a child into the system when other options are available. It's, it's harder to do kinship care. It's harder to find programs. It's harder to find resources. But that's what we need to do because it has been too easy to assume that as long as a child is sort of fed and housed, they're going to be okay. But if you take them away from their family, they are not going to be okay, or it's going to be much harder for them to be okay. So judges have to become, there, there's a social work aspect to it. And they judges have to find the way working with everyone in the system to find programs for housing, for treatment, for kinship care when that's necessary. Um, and it's, it takes a lot of hard work. A lot of judges are doing a good job of it. Some, some are not. But if I were on the court, I would commit to always doing the harder thing rather than doing the wrong and easier thing. Thank you. Let's go now to Judge John Padova. Thank you. Uh, I agree. Um, uh, with um, Craig Levin uh, and uh, Michelle Hangley, that we really have to find resources to help the parent uh, out of poverty, uh, social services. Just because a person is poor doesn't mean they neglect their children. Um, I think we should strive to keep the child with the parents. We have to look at programs to address uh, a parent's, for instance, uh, a drug addiction, if the parent has, has that. Um, we should also find other family members that can help out the parent and help the child through these tough times. Um, where the court always looks at what the best interest of the child is. And I think we have to exhaust all avenues to keep a, a child uh, with a parent regardless of whether the parent is in poverty or, or not. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go now to Betsy Wall. Betsy? Um, poverty should never, ever, ever play a part in removing a child from a home. Um, I thank you, Chris, uh, Chris Hall, for my shout out. But to just clarify, I'm in juvenile delinquency court and foster care, et cetera, is in, in dependent court. However, there is an overlap and I will explain. Um, foster care has profoundly negative effects on children's mental health, emotional health and development, obviously education, physical health and social well-being, and often leads to delinquency, which is where I see these uh, young people. Um, judges always have to put the interests of the child number one, first and foremost. They have to diligently search for kinship options if the parent parental home is not um, ap appropriate. Um, judges must be educated and know every tool accessible about putting services in the home to assist parents and families and keeping families intact. Um, I have quite a few kids that, I, that end up in juvenile delinquency court who are also in foster care or group homes through DHS, um, which is tragic. No parent is perfect. None of us that are parents are perfect. An, imp an imperfect parent is a lot better than a stranger and the courts have to continually remember that. Thank you. And Nick Kamau. Thank you. I mean, one of the things we see is uh, there's an assault and there's an attack an attack on poor people. We see that in the criminal, uh, criminal uh, justice arena. We see that in the family uh, arena. And under no circumstances should a, parental's, a parent's rights ever be terminated because they have housing insecurity. What I would do as a judge is I would uh, supervise the parent and help them find uh, housing resources. There are, there, there, there are, are dozens 
of governmental and community-based resources to help parents uh, you know, find housing, find good suitable housing, which is gonna be appropriate for, for a child to be, to be reared. And under no circumstance would I ever terminate a parent's rights for housing insecurity, nor would I, would I ever uh, prosecute someone for housing insecurity. That's absurd and it's a travesty. You know, one of the things we see in Pennsylvania is there are more children placed in, um, in, 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 in uh, through DHS uh, and more people who are arrested in, in Philadelphia than in any other city in the country. Uh, and, you know, poverty is certainly an issue, but there's a, there's a bigger problem. Um, and it's a much more uh, underlying, um, uh, really uh, negative issue that we have here in, in Philadelphia that we have to address. Uh, and it's really important that the voters understand the judges uh, who they're voting for and really look at uh, really what they stand for and what they've done. Not what they talk about, but what they've done. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your answers. That concludes that particular question. And we thank you, Tynetta Edens, Edens for, your, for your question. I apologize if I, if I mispronounced the name. Just wanna flag again, the wisdom and the insight that we did here uh, coming from our artists and residents today, Black Rap Medusa, um, and what they lifted up. Uh, and I'll just think about that in contrast to some of the answers that we've heard already uh, on this. Uh, he, they that have an ear, let them hear. Let's move now into our, 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 our fourth question in this open-ended question discussion. Um, getting some good substantive answers here, good discussion. We're now going to move now on housing and immigration question. And uh, from Juntos, we have Erica Nunez. And so we're asking Erica to come at this time. Erica. Thank you. Uh, I started my tenure as executive director of Juntos the day that Philadelphia admitted its stay at home order due to the pandemic. On my second day, I received a call from a member I will call Mari, who was being forcibly evicted from her home by her landlord after telling him she had been let go from her job as a domestic worker and would not be able to make rent that month. While we did our best to support Mari in staying in her home, she eventually chose to leave as it had become an unsafe home environment with constant harassment from her landlord and insufficient support from local entities to help her stay in her home. A year later, Mari is still experiencing housing insecurity, having entered into a tenuous living situation out of dire need with a landlord who is overcharging her rent for a house that is not fully finished or have hot water. We're in the process of taking the landlord to court, but worry that Mari will never find justice for the incidents this past year that's violated her rights and dignity as a tenant, as a person, and a resident of our city. Immigrant tenants, particularly those who are undocumented, do not have easy access to rent assistance programs due to language access, technological barriers, and a high burden of proof for identity and residency. Along that same vein, immigrant tenants do not have easy access to justice and are vulnerable to landlords who navigate the system with ease utilizing intimidation tactics and state tools like housing court to force people from their homes. This question is for the candidates running for municipal court judge. What can municipal judges do to ensure that housing court is a place where all Philadelphians, regardless of immigration status, can access justice instead of solely being a tool for landlords? So again, we're asking folks to use your reaction to raise your hand and we will, that'll, all right. I see Nick figured it out. All right. Awesome. I see Michelle and Gregory. I just want to wait just a few more moments to see if there are others who want to raise their hand and then we'll begin to take them, take those responses. Okay. All right, let's jump right into it. Sherry Cohen. Okay, um, thank you so much for your question. Um, I am a former tenant rights lawyer and I believe we need a tenant, uh, a tenant rights lawyer on uh, in our courts. Um, the, the court system, as you were saying uh, for tenants is, is just horrible. It is so slanted against tenants in every way. Um, we have a system where um, 
the court system actually channels tenants to go into back rooms. I call them the judgeless courtroom where tenants are encouraged by the official people in the court to meet with an attorney uh, in, in this back room, but the attorney is, but they don't say that that is an attorney who is the landlord's attorney. And people um, are uh, generally through that process discouraged to go before the judge and present their case before the judge. They're supposed to work at an agreement well, this agreement is also called a judgment by agreement. So it's not like a regular type of agreement. If you uh, vary at all from any of the terms of this judgment of agreement that you sign in this back room of the court, the eviction process immediately goes against you. So, you know, quickly. So um, it's, I, I believe we have to ban the use of the judgeless courtroom um, we have to ban these uh, judgments by agreements. Uh, I, I believe that housing is a human right and our whole system is geared to be pushing tenants down. And, um, you know, there's, you know, eviction records should be sealed. Uh, we need uh, lawyers for tenants. We do have a program in the city. 10 seconds. Okay, it needs to be really expanded. It should be about housing is a human right. That's what tenant court should be about. Thank you, Sherry. Let's go now to Michael Lambert. Michael. Thank you so much. You know, first I'd like to start off by saying that I will bring my personal experience to the bench. I am seeking the municipal court judge uh, position. I have been the people's lawyer and I'm asking to be the people's judge. The personal experience I alluded to, I'm, I'm talking about, I alluded to it earlier, where I am that immigrant child, even though it was 30 years ago, when I moved from Jamaica to Philadelphia with my mother and my sister, and we were the ones living at Chu Avenue and, and, and Upsal, and the landlord was knocking on our doors because we could not afford the rent. It's just as simple. We were late. We had issues. Um, so that experience, I'll never forget. I still remember it to this day. Now, there are programs that are available where we do have some uh, uh, attorneys which are there to assist uh, some individuals that can't represent themselves because they're not lawyers. However, there are not enough of them. I've been in landlord tenant court for the last 20 years and I've seen, uh, I've represented both sides, but I've seen that, you know, some of these attorneys are only limited to five or 10 uh, uh, clients per day. And sometimes there are 50, sometimes there are 40. We have to have more attorneys that are available for the tenants. We, as, as a judge, one of the things that I will do is I'll be pushing more to have those attorneys try to, to represent more clients. If not, I may have to continue that case to another time if that tenant is not gonna be fully uh, uh, represented. You know, at the end of the day, folks, we're dealing with human beings. And 10 seconds. At the end of the day, I'll be fair and I'll be just to everybody. I'll bring all my experiences to the bench and I'll be fair and just and I'll make the right decision. Thank you, Michael. Let's go out to Nick Kamau. Nick? Uh, thank you. So I think this really brings up a really important issue, uh, the, the intersectionality between uh, immigration and poverty. Uh, we've talked a lot about the, the uh, issues associated with poverty uh, in, in the city of Philadelphia, but we haven't really talked about how it impacts uh, the immigrant communities, especially non uh, undocumented immigrants. And one of the things that we really have to do is we have to ensure that human rights are being protected at all costs. And uh, immigration status should not impact that at all. Uh, I do agree and I believe that housing is a fundamental human right and an individual's uh, immigration status should not be impacted. Uh, we do have uh, uh, access to counsel for uh, in indigent uh, uh, tenants. Uh, and if I was, when I become judge, uh, should I uh, find myself in the uh, landlord tenant court? Uh, I'll make rulings that are consistent with 
uh, ensuring that all indigent or low income uh, tenants have an opportunity to consult with an attorney. As it relates to uh, the uh, not undocumented uh, uh, status, uh, we need to have not only attorneys who are representing uh, all of the, uh, the, the tenants, but we also have to ensure that they understand what their immigration, uh, any in immigration consequences would be. Uh, I don't believe that there should ever be a contact or communication from the courtroom uh, to ICE or any immigration officials, and that will never happen in my courtroom. Uh, more importantly, I think we need broad legislation which prevents that from happening. Thank you, Nick. Betsy Wall. Um, I'll try to be short because I know this question was really more for the municipal court candidates. Um, absolutely everyone who appears in landlord tenant court and faces a possible eviction must consult with a lawyer. They must be represented. It's outrageous that so many of those folks are not represented. Um, housing should not be contingent on immigration status and a short answer on the ICE issue. ICE has no place in our courtrooms at all, ever. Um, I've successfully kept it out of my juvenile courtroom and I will continue to fight to make sure that it stays out of every courtroom. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to John Padova. John? Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with Betsy while she, while she made some, some great uh, comments, although I'm not running for the municipal. Can I get in the house and get my camera taken? So maybe I didn't Although I'm, I'm not uh, running for a municipal court, I'm running for the Court of Common Pleas, uh, all of our human rights as a tenant should be protected. Housing is very, very important. It should not be taken away unfairly. We really have to make sure that the, the, the tenant and the immigrant is properly represented. I, was, I would postpone any type of hearing until that tenant has proper legal representation and had the opportunity uh, to meet with the attorney and ask all the questions and have the tenant's concerns addressed before uh, there is a hearing. I would also make sure that legal counsel must be provided for these tenants uh, and these immigrants with regard to tenant problems. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go down to Michelle Hangley. Um, this is an issue that's important to me because uh, Immigrants and immigrants in the city are an issue that's important to me. I have been representing immigrants pro bono in asylum cases, and I served for many years on the Board of Nationality Service Center, which assists asylum, uh, refugees, asylum applicants, immigrants of all kinds in issues, in, including housing. Uh, I would, I'm running for common pleas, so I wouldn't directly touch this issue, but I have views on policy. And those are that, first of all, I believe in civil Gideon. I believe that there should be a right to the representation of a lawyer in any case involving a major right, like not, not only your freedom, but your housing and your family, custody cases and dependency cases and, and housing cases. And I, the court is working towards that. We have a, it has a very, very long way to go. But I believe it's possible and that it should be available. Uh, language access is very important. The courts provide some, there's much more that they could do and that should be happening in every aspect of the court. That people should not be left sort of abandoned and not knowing what's going on simply because they don't speak the language. And the courts should continue and should work towards making sure that people's documented or undocumented status doesn't affect their rights because um, they are they are they have the rights of any tenant to remain in their housing or to not be exploited or abused by their landlords. So th those are things that as a common pleas judge, I would work toward to the extent I'm able to and advocate for. Thank you, Michelle. Let's go to Chris Hall. Chris. Hi, I, I am a candidate for the Court of Common Pleas, and so th this is uh, more of a municipal court matter, but I want to be clear that I stand for poverty having no uh, impact on anyone's rights in a courtroom, nor immigration status. Those are fundamental rights and uh, must be protected. Um, for your friend Mahdi, 
the there's an organization in Philadelphia called the Public Interest Law Center. They have won a multi-year um, grant to fund free legal services for tenants who are insecure. So if, if you haven't already sought out the resources of the Public Interest Law Center, I recommend them to you. They have a wonderful staff uh, of, of incredibly capable attorneys who are experts in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's have Gregory Yorgi Gurdy. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, we need judges that are empathetic, uh, particularly to families and the people of difference, diversity. And if an immigrant family comes in and are possibly losing their homes, uh, we need, they need counsel. They need to be heard in front of a judge. It is important to keep families together, to keep people in their homes, particularly during a pandemic. It, it's simple. We also need the counsel that are provided to them need to be uh, abreast of the issues, smart and capable. And, and, and municipal court's a people's court, so we should be advocating for people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Wendy. Wendy Barish. I, I also am not running for municipal, but I feel the need to speak up about this because everyone on this call can do something about this issue. The city passed a act more than a year ago, giving people the right to counsel. It has already been passed and it is not funded. Everyone who is on this call should be calling their city council people and anyone in position of authority in the city to remind them that the moratorium on evictions is not forever. And before that is up, someone needs to fund that bill to provide the people with the council that the city already declared that they have a right to. And that is not something, I'm not speaking as a judicial candidate on that. We can all be doing that. That needs to happen before that eviction moratorium is up. Thank you, Wendy. Let's go now to Craig. Craig Levin. Thank you. Um, I'm running for Court of Common Pleas, but I, I feel I have to speak on this issue because I do spend a lot of time in landlord tenant court. I do a lot of pro bono work. I know what goes on there. Michelle talked about language access. They do provide interpreters. I've been in there many, many times where interpreters are provided, and that's a necessary thing for immigrants who, who don't speak the language. And I, I'm proud to say I'm on the Board of Governors of the Philadelphia Bar Association, as Wendy is. And she was talking about the Civil Guinean, where you provide attorneys for tenants that are in landlord tenant court. That is happening right now. CLS always has an attorney in there. I was just in there last week representing a tenant pro, uh, pro bono. And uh, Vic, who is a fellow committee man who works for C CLS, he was in there representing tenants who didn't have representation. This is a necessary thing that we have to have, and it does have to be funded. We can thank Helen Gim, who uh, a council person who introduced this bill back in November of 2019, and also Elizabeth Fido Fiedler, our state representative. There's a house bill out there where you will expunge the records similar to a criminal case for tenants who have judgments against them. I, when I represent tenants, they're so worried that if there is an eviction, they're not going to be able to rent another place or they're going to have to go to some shady landlord. These are the things that we really got to take care of. And I'm in landlord tenant court. I know what goes on there and the things could be better, but there has been a movement and there has been a lot of improvement. Thank you, Craig. Thank you all for your answers. Um, we are having a wonderful discussion. Uh, I just want to flag one thing that just stood out to me, resonates deep in my soul, and I'll just say it and leave it at that. Housing is a human right. Amen. I mean, and I'm in. Um, we're, we have one more question. I know there are a number of folks who are who are, uh, uh, are, are have been hanging in here with us from the very beginning. We started promptly on time and we're moving right on through. We have another question and then we're gonna go ahead and wrap for the evening. So for their folks, we're trying to gauge their time and see uh, if, they, if they can hang on any longer. Listen, hang out with us just a little while longer and we're gonna be drawing this thing to a close. This has been a fabulous discussion. We have one more extremely important thing to get at. And the next question that we have is around values and trauma. Yeah. And, um, and so we, we, we have a representative from 215 People's Alliance, Sarah Thompson, who is going to bring us our, our final question for the evening. Sarah. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Sarah Thompson, currently working with 215 People's Alliance and on the Justice for All team. 
My question for the candidates is this. Um, do you agree that the root cause of adversity is tied to physical and mental illnesses, prolonged trauma, and poverty? If so, how will you address this in your courtroom? Can you say the question one more time? I'm sorry, Sarah, one more time for us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, um, do you agree that the root cause of adversity is tied to physical and mental illnesses, prolonged trauma and poverty? If so, will you address this in your courtroom? Thank you so much. And so we've heard the question twice over. And so we're gonna give us a few moments for uh, candidates to raise their hand in uh, with the reaction. Um, uh, I think everyone knows how to do it now, and so we'll give you a chance to, 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 to raise your hand before we start to dig in here. Just a few more moments before we jump in. All right. And of course, if there are those who want to, to raise their hand as others are answering, you're more than welcome to do that, and we are interested in hearing, hearing your responses if you so choose to answer. Let's begin uh, with Wendy Barish. Wendy. First, you keep your implicit bias out of the courtroom and you, everyone has it. People don't wanna talk about it. It makes you uncomfortable. We all have it. You think something about me. I think something about you. When someone comes into your courtroom, I don't believe that people have your question. So yes, yes, people who are subjected to those situations that's what creates the problems. If you are not treating those situations, you are contributing to those problems. So when you have an individual in your courtroom, and if it's in criminal court, you should be looking at what kind of programming is available to help this individual. There are terrible crimes that are committed in this city. And it, when that went in at Macy's, when that happened, I was so upset. I've been in that store. Immediately after I felt upset, I thought, what happened in that person's life that made them think that this was something they could do? You need to realize that I do not believe that people are born evil. We are responsible for how people respond to situations. And as a society, we should be caring for each other. And that doesn't stop when you're on the bench. So you need to look at a person and what has happened in their life and what their path was that got them to appear before you in that courtroom. And keep your biases out of that room. And when you proceed from a place of empathy and kindness and you want to solve the situation, there are programming. There are things that you can do as a judge to try to solve a situation because what you do to one person doesn't just affect one person. It affects their family and it affects people for generations. Thank you, Wendy. I know that it, while you were sitting there, I don't know if others experienced it, we, there was a cut out there for a second. This is the reason why it's so important for folks to use the handles, uh, the hashtags, to tweet out things like that. This allows you to have access to the candidates in there. And, and if you didn't hear something that you wanted to hear, please tweet them, please check in with them uh, to get that answer, all right? Thank you, Wendy, for your, for, your, for, your, for your question. Let's go now to Chris Hall. Chris? Hi, this is a question about values and it's a great question. Um, I think all of the candidates, I can comfortably speak for all the candidates, that we are a group of emp emp empathetic people who have always tried collectively to do the right thing and make the world a better place. One example I can give you to demonstrate my values in the under two minutes that I have is um, I've been on the board of an organization called the Philadelphia Diversity Law Group for more than 15 years. And this is a, uh, an organization that provides um, early internships to diverse law students so that they have a leg up when they go to their second year of law school and have that ever important second summer experience where they perhaps will get a full-time job that will lead them um, in, into a career. And many of these people, uh, can, these diverse students that are, are the first generation in their families to go to college and then law school. And so what we do is we provide professional coaching mentoring, and then they're a, a, a job between their first and second years of law school where they otherwise wouldn't have a job. Uh, that's a very rare thing for any law student to have. And so though that's one of the things I've done in my career for the last 15 years. Um, and, and these values are, are core to me and to I think every other candidate. So thank you for this wonderful question. Thank you for answering it. John Padova. Yes, that, thank you for the question. 
Um, I am in, I'm sensitive to the importance of diversity and recognizing that we must be sensitive to implicit bias uh, in our courtroom. And that starts with, with values. Um, I recognize when people come into my courtroom, uh, they are uh, traumatized, uh, they're very anxious, and I like to get to the root of, of the, the problem and basically um, steer them towards diversionary programs uh, to uh, treat any type of, of uh, mental illness, mental condition, drug treatment program, or any type of uh, anxiety that I see that occurs uh, in my courtroom. Uh, and I believe uh, the panel that's here today, uh, all the judicial candidates are uh, empathetic with regard to implicit bias and the values that we must instore in our courtroom. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Lambert. Thank you. Judges are public servants. We're here to serve the society. We're here to serve the people. Everyone should be treated equally and fairly. However, unfortunately, that's not always the case. I have been, and, and I'm sure everyone has had their issues throughout life, but I have been uh, treated differently uh, because I'm in a margin, I'm a marginalized member of society being an African-American man and also being of Jamaican descent uh, with, a, with an accent. I will not tolerate any form of bias in my courtroom. And I will always check my own self to make sure that I am not bringing any biases to the bench. I think as judges, we are required to do that constantly. We have to keep checking ourselves to make sure we're not being bringing any implicit biases to that bench. And based on my experience throughout my life, I will not tolerate that in my courtroom. It will never happen. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Gregory Yorgi Gurdy. Uh, simply put, I'm a gay black man. I know about adversity. I live it every single day. I bring empathy to the bench because I have to survive through that. So I understand. I will listen to every single person. My family is created through diversity and inclusion, and it's important to me. That's what I live by. It's very simple. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Betsy Wall. Um, first on the question of trauma, um, I'd like to address that. I would say that most people that come into a criminal courtroom or a juvenile courtroom have been victims of some sort of trauma. Um, in fact, women more than men, women of color more than women in general. Um, we have to realize as judges um, that people come into court already traumatized by either mental illness, sexual abuse, physical abuse, substance abuse, all kinds of trauma. Um, I run a trauma-informed courtroom. It's very important that all of us learn these things and know how to deal with it. Incarceration serves nothing, it solves nothing, and can ex exacerbate the trauma as can an experience in the courtroom. So we all have to be cognizant of that and make sure that we are um, make, uh, making people feel as comfortable as possible and that everyone is heard. Um, as far as values, I hope that you all learned a lot about our values from listening to these discussions tonight. And hopefully you can look into those things further. But I would like to add that it's really important that the public and all of the, those of you that are listening feel that our courtrooms will be as transparent as possible, that we are welcome, that you'd be welcome to come and observe, and that although we wouldn't, as judges, be able to talk about specific cases, we can certainly talk about policy, and that you, the public, are stakeholders just the same as anyone who's actually has a court case that day, and we would welcome those policy discussions in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Levin? Thank you. Um, Sarah, you're absolutely right. That is a big part of the root cause there. Um, how will I address that in my courtroom? I'm going to care. That's the most important thing you could do. You got to care about another human being. You got to sit up on that bench and, and see somebody in front of you and try to figure out what brought them to that place in their life. 
And, and that means you, you got to spend some time. They're just not another name and number, uh, somebody to dispose of on your list. They're a human being with a family, mother, father, children, whatever it may be. You got to care. And that's the root of everything. You know, I, I do so much community service. I'm out there working with uh, formerly incarcerated citizens, uh, trying to understand the issues that brought them to that place in their life. I could read a million, a million articles. I can come on here and give a fancy speech and use all the fancy buzzwords. But the important thing is my actions. I'm out there learning because at some point I'm going to be sitting on the bench. I'm going to make decisions that are going to affect their lives, their family lives, their community. And I have to know where they came from. I have to understand those issues. We all have a superpower, and that's the ability to help another human being. It's one of the greatest feelings in the world. It's something that I do all the time. I'm going to bring that experience to the bench, and that's how I'm going to address that issue when I'm a judge. Thank you, Craig. Let's go now to Sherry Cohen. Sherry? Thank you um, for the question. You know, uh, I want to lift up a comment somebody made in the chat. I just think it's really great that courts or the experience of courts are oftentimes traumatic. So I think we who are running for the for these seats have to, you know, see that um, you know the court system itself creates so much trauma and violence. Like evictions are violence, incarceration is violence, and if we want to change from that. You know, it's yes, we want to have trauma informed and trauma responsive courtrooms where our individual courtrooms are, we're showing care and wanting to, um, you know, not incarcerate people and wanting to keep families together. But we can also be part of efforts to transform the system from the, um, you know, the um, racist uh, system that it is to a restorative system that is about uh, how do we keep people free? How do we free people? How do we keep people free? How do we provide supports from housing to food to uh, mentoring? I mean, so, so many supports are needed. And, um, you know, my values are of transformation in our systems, uh, of our core systems and, um, being that kind of a judge who understands my role in the whole system and that I do not want to continue being traumatic, continuing the violence of this uh, anti-Black uh, racist and classist system. Thank you, Sherry, thank you. Michelle Hangley. So in my career, I've been practicing for more than 20 years. I've represented people, pro bono clients who faced serious, serious trauma, uh, torture victims, people who have been beaten and tortured in prison, both abroad and in the United States, people with serious mental illnesses, and many people seeking protection from abuse orders. And in all of those cases, when you're sitting with your client, talking with your client, the, the, the fear is palpable. Uh, and my job as their attorney is to help them nonetheless present their case in a way that the judge will understand, a judge who may not understand at all what they've been through and may have no sympathy for it at all. So if I am elected, I want to make sure, and I agree with the comment in the chat, that, that being in court is a trauma for many people. Um, I wanna make sure my courtroom inflicts the least amount of, of trauma possible. And that goes to the entire atmosphere of the courtroom how the staff are trained, how they treat people, how I treat people. And I also always want to be aware that my experience and my perceptions of how people tell the truth is not the same. It's not the same across cultures, and it's definitely not the same for people who have faced, as you describe, physical, mental illnesses, lengthy trauma. Um, and so the court has to meet those people where they are and understand where they're coming from because if we don't, then things are just going to get worse. Thank you, Michelle. And seeing no other hands raised. Okay, Brother Nick, come out. We'll end with you. Uh, thank you. So life for an African-American in this country is traumatic. All right, um, there's no two ways about it. Um, 
I, I, when I grew up, you know, I had uh, the Klan targeted my family and burned a cross in front of our house. I've received death threats in the mail. Uh, that's all traumatic. Uh, when I'm, you know, driving in my car and I get stopped and pulled over for doing nothing other than than uh, driving while black, that's traumatic. Uh, when you know I get slighted at work, uh, you know, because I'm black, that's traumatic. Uh, you know, when uh, you know, when, when I'm, I'm walking down the street and, you know, the, the, the woman who, you know, the, 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 the Caucasian woman clutches her purse uh, while I'm wearing my suit, uh, you know, because she thinks I'm going to take her purse is traumatic. When I go to the courthouse and I try to sit uh, in the attorney's row in the front, in the front uh, row and they tell me, oh, that's for the, that's for the lawyers. And I have my suit in my backpack, you know, my, my, my briefcase with me. And they say, oh, that's for the lawyers. They think I'm a criminal defendant uh, just because I'm a black man. That's traumatic. Um, and so it takes that understanding uh, and it takes th th that, that realization uh, that every statement made by law enforcement isn't true. Uh, and just because you identify something as being a high crime area doesn't mean in fact it is. Uh, and just because someone says they can smell marijuana doesn't mean they actually did. Uh, and there's, there's all kinds of issues that are going on you know, behind the scenes. Every day of my life, I live the experience of being a black man. And as such, being black and race is the first thing that's the, the I'm always conscious of that. In everything I do, in all of my co communications, all of my decisions, everything is based on that framework. And truth be told, everyone else does it too. They just don't all admit 10 it. seconds. And we thank you, Nick, for your answer. And we thank every single one of you who have stayed with us tonight, all the candidates. Thank you uh, to Betsy Wall. Thank you, Chris Hall. Thank you, Craig Levin. Thank you, Greg Yorgi Gurdy. Thank you, John Padova. Thank you, Michael Lambert. Thank you, Michelle Hangley. Thank you, Nick Kamal. Thank you, Sherry Cohen. And thank you, Wendy Barish, for your intentionality with your answers your engagement with the questions and your willingness uh, to accommodate us in our requests. This has made for quite the conversation, quite the forum on tonight. And we are just super, super um, uh, filled with uh, insight. I wanna just say, as we draw this to a close, uh, that, that Philadelphia, uh, as many on this call already know, um, is the poorest big city in the country. 24.5% of our population lives in abject poverty. Uh, we also recognize that across the Commonwealth, we find schools that are better funded than our own right here in the, in the city of Philadelphia, uh, just contributing to um, uh, a population of, of, of youth who are being raised in, in poor learning conditions, having to overcome incredible obstacles to receive the education that we know uh, is the pathway to power. Um, we also recognize that 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 that, that housing uh, is something that has been utilized not uh, is not necessarily seen as a human right here in Philadelphia, but as, as seen as a, as a place to make profit. Uh, that homes are not necessarily the place where we build our lives, but where we can extract wealth out of our communities. And we are seeing that when you see the the, the connections of uh, a a deeply poor, uh, uh, unhoused, uh, low education, and largely black and brown city. These are the makings of, of, of high crime or pathways to, uh, to, to, to courts, to judges. Uh, and, um, and so we, we must understand that tonight is called judge the judges for a reason, because these persons who are, who are judges and wanting to be judges are asking for your vote. They're asking for you to, to, to allow them to come and to, to strike the gavel as it relates to your family members as it relates to your loved ones, as it relates to not just your family members, but also your city, your future. And we believe that this is what democracy looks like, that when they are engaging, when these wonderful candidates that have come here today are engaging with us, we are the ones that ultimately uh, will decide whether or not they have the opportunity to serve on the bench. And so our, our suggestion to you is to vote your values, to vote for freedom, to vote for those persons who are going to be as I like to say, co-conspirators with us for the new world that we're looking to usher in. We don't have to be shy about it. This is these are these are not a, a, a appointments. These are uh, to, to the bench. These are elections, and so we, the people, 
are looking for a more just city, a more free city, a more liberated city. And we wanna make sure that we are electing persons who are going to help us usher that new reality in. So I hope that you have heard what you needed to hear tonight. This is not the only time we're having this conversation. Listen, tomorrow, we are coming right back here, same bat time, same bat station, uh, to, to hear uh, more questions and to hear more answers to help us to get to that city uh, that King said, not just the New Jerusalem, but the New Philadelphia that we're looking for. So um, again, thank you all for, for joining us on tonight. Uh, make sure that you are uh, hashtagging uh, any of the insights that you, that, that you, that you heard. Uh, ta uh, also tagging persons, uh, if you have questions for them, what have you. Uh, and, and keep the conversation going. Though we may be ending the discourse for tonight, we'll pick it up again tomorrow, uh, leading with Tanya Ba, the dynamic Tanya Ba will be emceeing tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having some other uh, guests as well uh, to help break it up. I just want to thank again, Reclaim Philadelphia for the, 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 the efforts that you put into this, the judicial accountability team, the, 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 the many groups that have been a part of this, 215 People's Alliance, Juntos, One PA, the Philadelphia Bail Fund, Reclaim Philadelphia, Power Live Freeze Team, uh, Ice Out of Courts, Free the Ballot, and the Working Families Party. We're so thankful for all that you have offered to this conversation. And we look forward to you and all your membership coming back uh, tomorrow uh, as we continue this on, all right? Uh, most of y'all have stuck with us and we said that we would honor your time. So we're going to do just that. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you, Katia Perez, uh, for your, for helping us in all the ways that you have. I'm going to turn it back over to you to close us out.